So after we published our tutorial on caustics two weeks ago, you guys had questions. How do you render this? Why not USA noise? We make it tillable. And I think all of those are good questions, especially the ones concerning rendering out this stuff as an image sequence. However, the first question I'd like to answer is this one. Why not use paint a texture? And while painting a texture is an absolutely valid idea, especially if you're working on a still frame and want great art directability, it can be tiresome. Because if you want changes, you have to repaint the whole thing. And also, it might be difficult to animate. Because, well, you have to hand animate it. But when it comes to drastic changes, like the overall look of the caustics pattern, that's, in my opinion, done a bit quicker with a procedural setup. So I think the great advantage of procedural generative setups is the ability to iterate and to quickly incorporate client feedback once the setup is done. So with that being said, let's tackle the other questions. So that's our setup from last time, and how would I go about rendering this out? Well, actually, what we created here is a two-dimensional volume. In essence, nothing but a bitmap, with the individual voxels acting as pixels in this case. So let's treat it at this and use Houdini's compositing network, COPS, to write this out as an image sequence. For that, I'll just append a null to my volume rasterized particles here. Call this one out underscore caustics. Highlight this. And next to it, drop down a copnet, or a cop2 network to be precise, which is Houdini's compositing network for working with two-dimensional images. So let's dive in there. And in here, let's import our two-dimensional volume using a sub import node, which will point to our output null that we just created. And you can already see a thumbnail down here. And when we go to composite view to check what we're doing, we see this slightly distorted image of what we created. To fix that, let's click on set resolution from sub, which in the image tab made sure we are creating an image with the same resolution as our volume. Volume. In our case, 1000 by 1000 voxels, aka pixels in this case. However, as this is Houdini Apprentice, it has a limited output resolution, limited to 720p. So actually, I'm going to rescale this to 720 by 720 in order to be able to render this out using Houdini Apprentice. Also, when we middle mouse on this, we can see we now created two channels, a color channel containing RGB data and an alpha channel. In our case, what we could do is use a delete node to delete the alpha channel, but for now, we'll just leave it in there and directly attach a ROP file output, which we're going to use to save this file. And this also has a tab in here where we can select which planes, that means which channels we want to output. So currently, we're exporting a color and an alpha channel. However, in my case, I'm just going to export a single color channel. As we haven't animated this yet, um, our current frame range from 1 to 240 will output the same image. So maybe before rendering this out, let's just save this and go back to our grid here and set up a quick animation. So again, let's go to a scene view as well. And up here in the mountain, let's set up a really cheap animation, just offsetting this noise on the Y direction with a short expression $FF times 0, 0.0, maybe 3. So we're slowly moving this noise up resulting in this movement. So now that we have some motion, let's go back into our copnet, go to our composite view. Let's just reset this, hit play to make sure that our animation is being ported across. All right, let's write this out by highlighting our ROP out node here, making sure our output path is set correctly. And what I like to do usually is copy this forward slash dollar hip name and paste it twice. So I now create a subfolder with the same name as my setup and save my resulting file sequence in there. So let's again save this and hit render. So after this is done exporting, let's just check and let's go to our file location and open this. And we see, yes, we exported this animation here with a watermark, of course, resulting from the Houdini Apprentice version that I'm using here to record this tutorial. All right, let's make this tileable. And for that, let's go back to our scene view, make sure we're in our geo context and not in the copnet anymore. And in order to make these caustics tileable, I'll have to make sure that my grid up here is actually tiling so that this edge matches up with this edge. And to check this, let's just drop down a transform, set this to translate along the x-axis wire in this mountain here and ghost it. And now we can see that these edges here do in fact not match up. And to take care of this, I'm going to use the attribute noise, which is offering me a few more intricate settings than the mountain node here, wiring in my grid, piping this into my transform and highlighting my attribute noise here. And you can clearly see this is not having the effect that we were hoping for. So actually I want to noise my P attribute. However, not along all three axes. So let's scale down the X and the Z axis so that we're just moving my grid up and down. And in the noise type, I want to select periodic flow. I could also use the periodic purlin because those are noises that in theory should match up and should be periodic. And when we look at the edge, this clearly still is matching. So let's go down here and make sure that our lacunarity is set to two. This is from the help card of this node, and it actually specifies that the periodicity can only be guaranteed with a 
like you're already setting of 2.0. So that's what we're ending up with. Let's dial back the amplitude a bit to say 0.2 and see if we like its output. That's looking promising, except for it's not what we're actually doing here. So let's wire in this. Okay, we can see a bit tough tiling here. So let's dial in our noise. And after a bit of tinkering around, I arrived at those settings, an amplitude of 0.6 with an element scale of 1, spatial period of 10, maximum octaves of 3 and a roughness of 0.4. Again, that's down to you tweaking, experimenting and seeing what looks right. Next, let's take care of making this really tileable actually, because what you can see in those edges here is that we are getting these areas where we are missing some caustics. And those come from the fact that when we highlight this ad here, that we have some caustics that lie out of the boundary of our volume, which is 10 by 10 units. So what we have to do is make sure that we add those areas that are out of the boundary onto the other side of the volume. We'll have to implement what's called a wrap around. Let's do that using a simple point triangle, which we'll wire in after the ad, which then goes into the volume rasterize. Let's sort it like this. And in the point triangle, for our current point, we want to check if our current points X position is bigger than 5.0, which is this case here, for example. And if it is bigger than 5.0, we're just going to subtract 10 units from its current X position. Like this. This worked for this side. Let's do the same thing for the case that we're smaller than minus 5. And in this case, just add 10 to our current X position. That also worked. And let's just copy the whole block and do the same for the Z position. So now we're ending up with this. Let's have a look at our caustics again. And you'd say that is almost fine. Seeing very few areas in which we're noticing anything weird. Let's highlight the points again. And I want to bring your attention to those areas here, or those areas. What's happening there is that due to the fact that we're using point normals when we calculate refraction, and point normals are usually calculated between adjacent vertices, we are getting errors in the point normals here at the edges. So what we'd have to do is we'll have to provide a border for our grid before we calculate the point normals. Basically what we want to do is add a strip of polygons around our grid before we calculate the normals. So if this is our grid here, and just for figuring this out, let's dial back its rows and columns to 10. And let's hide this transform here and have a look at this. So we set our rows and columns to 10, resulting in one nine polygons along each axis. In order to set this up procedurally, let's add two sliders, both integers. Let's call one resolution and one size. And you could turn those into vectors as well if you want irregular grids. However, I'm just assuming a square grid here. So let's hit apply and accept. The size, let's set that to 10 as we have it currently. And the resolution, let's set it to 10 as well. So let's think about it. A resolution of 10 with a size of 10 will result in this very grid having nine polygons. Actually, what we want is 11 polygons. So we want to add two polygons in the rows and two polygons in the columns. So what I could do instead of dialing this in manually is just drag my resolution up here as a relative channel reference Do the same thing for our rows and just add two rows and columns to those sliders. So now I can increase or decrease my resolution with a single slider. However, this does not add those additional two rows and columns on the outside of the grid, but inside of my 10 by 10 grid. So I'll have to account for the additional two polygons on each side by resizing my grid. And to resize this, I want to take my original size again, drag this up here as a relative channel reference and add to it two times my plane size. So let's copy this and paste it in here as a relative reference. My grid size divided by, again, parentheses here, divided by my resolution, copy parameter, paste this up here as a relative reference. And I'll have to subtract one from my grid size to make this proper. And let's just copy the whole expression here and paste it in the second component as well. So now you can see that the inner polygons without the outer row of polygons stays the same size, no matter what resolution I'll dial in here. So let's increase this to 500. And in order to be able to delete those extra polygons here, let's put them in a separate group using a group node, call this one edge. Let's use the points, disable the base group and include by edges. And let's drag this down here and check unshared edges and highlight our groups up. And now we can see we only highlighted the outer row of points here, which we can delete later. Okay, now we noise this thing, we calculate its normals. And after we calculate its normals, let's delete our 
edge here, it's points. So that is working. And now when we highlight our final caustics output, we can see we are getting what looks like correct caustics everywhere. So again, let me go over this. Not much to see here, except we use the attrib noise to create a periodic flow noise on our plane, making sure that these edges match. Then in our grid up here, we wrote a short hscript expression to just add one row of polygons around our main grid, allowing us to flexibly dial in resolution and size of that grid. Use that to calculate normals, then deleted this outer edge of points. And then down here, just made sure we wrap around points that are past this grid onto the other side and then rasterizing the whole thing, resulting in this nice repetitive caustics grid here. However, that looks a bit sparse. So let's increase our grids resolution to say, 1200, which of course takes a bit longer to calculate, but results in this much nicer image. And the crucial part in that setup for me actually was finding out about those normals and this extra strip of polygons that you need to calculate them properly. A fact that our friend Fritz Kemmler actually pointed out. So now let's have a bit of fun with that and also answer the question of why not just use a noise pattern instead of generating the caustics with this displaced grid and our refraction code. Well, I personally haven't found a noise pattern that looks like a caustic pattern, at least not convincingly. And also with a noise pattern, you are not able to do what we are about to do. So after we dropped our attrib noise here, Let's drag this all down a bit, maybe get rid of a few nodes that we don't need, like so. So after our attrib noise, I'm just going to drop down an attrib paint, which allows me to paint in an attribute in here. And the attribute by default is called mask, which is fine for me now. Let's just head to the tool and by scrolling on my mouse wheel, increase this. And let's just write down a nice N here for Antagma, like so. And next with a bit of code and a point wrangle, Let's offset our points depending on the mask value. So in here, what I want to do is I want to take my points Y position and add to it the mask value times say 0 0.2. So now what it is, is I offset this N maybe a bit more 0.4 like so. And let's wire this into the normal, pipe this through our whole setup and let's have a look at the output here. And you can see we added this caustic N and the offset might be a bit big. So let's dial this back to 0 0.2. Two. And now my N is kind of subtle. So maybe let's dial back the attrib noise strength here in the amplitude. Let's dial that to 0.4. And again, my N maybe needs a bit more offset. And now when I look at it, one thing that I'd like to do is after I've drawn in my mask, I would like to blur out those values a bit using an attrib blur. And we want to blur the mask attribute before we use that to offset our points. So in between those two, it goes. Let's highlight this and maybe increase our blurring iterations to say 32, which gets rid of those strong creases in here when we compare without and with the blurring. Let's increase this even further to 128 and have a look at the resulting caustics. Yeah, and I like that a good bit better. So what this setup allows me to do is either with the help of this attrib paint or with a group node and maybe a font node, do actual caustic type in here. And as we haven't touched our attrib noise, and we're just adding a bit of offset to those areas. When I play, the animation should still play, which of course it doesn't because we had that set up in the mountain and not in our attrib noise up here. So let's down in the offset, just move this $FF times 0 0.02 along the Y axis. And now if I hit play, of course, this takes a bit of time to calculate, but we see the animation is being passed through. And that's definitely something I'd have difficulties to pull off with a simple noise pattern instead of this caustic pattern. So I hope that answers these questions on our caustics generator. Of course, what you could do is split these caustics now into three channels, R, G, and B, and use different indices of refraction to generate not only caustics, but also chromatic aberrations, or take into account the depth that those rays pass through and attenuate those rays depending on the water depth. Actually a pretty nice setup to add a few features of your own, which of course I'm very intrigued to see. And as always, if you want to see more of us, if you want to get access to in-depth courses, or if you plainly want to support us, head over to our Patreon. And a huge thanks goes out to all of our patrons, especially Chris Hebert, Rafik Anadol, Parasol Island, Gearbox Studio Quebec, Encore VFX, and Important Looking Pirates. Thanks so much, guys. And as always, see you next time. And it's cheers and goodbye.